Hello, everybody, and welcome to No Summary, Golden Thread's online conversations with artists who don't fit in a box. For those of you who don't know, Golden Thread is the first theater company in the U.S. devoted to the Middle East, founded by playwright and director Taran Shagiazarian in 1996. I'll be your moderator today. My name is Marina Johnson, uh, and I'm a director, dramaturg, and PhD candidate. Uh, I'm excited to be here today um, with Marina Barhun, who I'll tell you more about momentarily. Golden Thread Productions acknowledges that the land we occupy is the home of the Ramatush Ohlone people known colonially today as San Francisco. As we recognize the ancestral stewards of this land and acknowledge that our presence here is a reminder of the dark history of colonization and dispossession, we are outraged by the U.S. administration's complicity in perpetuating the same cycle of oppression, land theft, and genocide in Palestine. Golden Thread Productions is dedicating its entire season to Palestine because we believe it's our duty as artists and culture makers to speak out against injustice and stand with the oppressed. This season is our response to the systemic and continuous erasure of the Palestinian people and the silencing of their stories, culture, and their history. We do this not only for Palestinians, but for our collective humanity. No summary this year, and in line with Golden Thread's season for Palestine, embarks on a tour of four Palestinian cities to offer audiences in the U.S. and beyond a taste of the Palestinian theater scene today. Each episode will spotlight a different theater, showcasing its history, notable performances, challenges, and life behind the scenes through interviews with its artists and community members. We are honored to be joined today by Marina Barham from Masra Al Hara in Beit Jala. Marina Barham is the co-founder and general director of El Hara Theater, the president of the Palestinian Performing Arts Network from 2019 to 2021. An active cultural operator in Palestine, the Middle East, and in Europe since 1998, Marina is a fellow of ISPA, International Society for the Performing Arts, and Salzburg Global Seminar. Uh, the International Network for Contemporary Performing Arts Global Connector, and she's also a board member in 2023. She's a trainer in the field of cultural management in the Arab world since 2006 with El Marad Resource, Tomasi Collective, and Goethe Institute in Berlin and in Palestine. She is a speaker at several international conferences, festivals, and events. For the folks who are here with us in the Zoom room, but also those tuning into the live stream on HowlRound, we welcome you. And for those who are here with us, please feel free to utilize the chat function to post your comments and questions throughout the conversation. Today, we'll be talking about the work that El Hara Theater creates and how it has been affected during the ongoing genocide. Marina, it's great to be with you today uh, on Zoom and inshallah soon in person. Thank you very much, Marina. How Thank are you? you? Um. <laughs> It's a very uh, complicated question. Actually. Yeah. Uh, we have been uh, for the last nine months living uh, our ups and downs. Some days we cannot get up, and we cannot work, and we cannot think, and we keep watching the news uh, on daily basis. Uh, we are in touch with friends in Gaza to see how they are, and actually to. We, we don't dare even ask them how they are. We just ask them, you know, can you tell me if you're okay? Because it's a difficult question. So some days we push ourselves and we say we have to get up, we have to do things, we have to continue, we have to try to be creative in finding solutions to continue our work as a theater and also to continue trying to support artists in Gaza uh, because they are living in, in a difficult and complicated situation where they're displaced more than 10 times in the last nine months. So I'm okay. I have uh, had some good days recently because I am uh, trying to reach out to different people and also to educate people about what is happening and to explain the situation. So if you allow me, Marina, I'm going to try and uh, share a screen to try and explain a little bit uh, uh, the context, because I know that a lot of people know the context, 
but still it's important to share uh, this uh, context with them. So, so to explain, Palestine uh, has been losing a lot of lands from even before 1917 and onwards, and then 1947. And as you can see, the original map of Palestine and how by every year it started shrinking until today, we have uh, divided areas of the West Bank and we have the Gaza Strip and we have small dots of green, which is Palestine in, distributed in different areas. So our space is shrinking not only uh, by the land, but also by movement, by uh, freedom of expression, by continuous oppression on a daily basis. And I wanted to explain to people that it hasn't started from the 7th of October. You know, the story of Palestine started a long time ago and the oppression by the Israeli occupation continued on many, many, many years, almost today it's 75 years. And uh, people in Gaza have not started the 7th of October incidents from vague. You know, they have been under siege for 17 or 18 years. And this is like the fourth or fifth war they have lived. I have friends who are teenagers and who say they have lived four wars. Imagine a teenager living four different wars. And the situation in uh, Gaza is not uh, only the genocide that you hear about on a daily basis. Also in the West Bank, since uh, the 7th of October, over 7,000 people have been arrested in the West Bank and over 650 people have been killed. Heads of cultural organizations, like the head of the Freedom Theater, Mr. Mustafa Shifa, the head of Ibda Cultural Center, Mr. Khaled Safi, artists from the Palestinian Circus School, uh, artists from El Funun Dance Group have been arrested. And usually what they do is they sentence them to uh, administrative detention because they do not have any evidence against them. Not only that, but violence from settlers from the Israeli occupation military have increased tremendously on different areas like Jenin, Tulkarem, Hebron, and Bethlehem. And this has caused a lot of fear among uh, people uh, it took me almost six months to be able to leave Bethlehem, which was completely closed, to go to Ramallah. And I was so worried, so scared to go to Ramallah because on the checkpoint, there were several stories of people being arrested because they had any kind of material or post on their mobiles about Gaza. So for almost two weeks, I was having nightmares and I was trying to erase everything on my mobile. And I even thought to change my mobile into these little Nokia mobiles that don't have any uh, cameras or any status or any social media uh, to be able to, uh, to go to them. So this is how we have been living for the last nine months. And this fear has been traumatizing for everyone, from uh, a child to uh, older women to uh, younger men uh, to people with disability, everyone has been traumatized uh, because of this. Thank you, Marina, for that context. I think that hopefully people watching know that this started way before October 7th, but the context you gave is so hopeful because the US media would have you really believe otherwise. Yeah. Um, you mentioned traveling, and I think just for people who are listening, because El Hara is in Beit Jala, 
Um, can you tell us where Beit Jala is, especially in relationship to Bethlehem or other places maybe they've heard of too? Well, uh, Beit Jala is a very small town on a mountain, which is about five minutes away by car to Bethlehem. And if the roads are open, it's about 20 minutes away from Jerusalem. But sadly, we cannot go to Jerusalem because we have West Bank ID card, and this means we need to have a permit to enter Jerusalem. And since October 7th, none of the West Bank people can enter Jerusalem. Even employees of international organizations cannot go to Jerusalem for their work because they canceled all the permits to enter Jerusalem. And uh, Bejala is the, the name uh, means the house of uh, grass because uh, they say there was a story that there was a king called Jala who looked on the valley has green on the valley. That's why they called it Beit Jala, which is five minutes away from the Nativity Church by far. Thank you. It's uh, a beautiful place, Beit Jala. And so just uh, for people to have the, the context. Uh, and when you were talking about going to Ramallah, how long does it usually take you to get from Beit Jala to Ramallah? Well, this is another story because um, uh, to go to Ramallah, we have to use a different road. We cannot use the Jerusalem road to go to, to Ramallah. So we have to use a road called the Valley of Fire. And this is an old Roman road that was created by the Romans a long time ago. So it's very steep, it's very hilly, it's very dangerous during rain, during the winter time. And usually, in normal days, it takes two hours to get there. But since October, sometimes it takes five hours because the entrances to Ramallah, there's only one entrance open. So it's uh, full of traffic. So sometimes it takes five hours. Sometimes if, we, if the checkpoint called Container, which is near Bethany, is closed, you can stay to 10 hours to be able to cross and get to Ramallah. That's why the idea of, of closing the cities from each other and putting checkpoints everywhere is just to isolate the cities, the Palestinian districts and the areas from each other. So it's very difficult to go to Jenin, to go to Turkarem and Nablus. We haven't seen our partners in Jenin and Turkarem and Nablus for over now, over nine months. So it's not easy. Uh, mobility is so complicated. And we're talking about internal mobility in the West Bank, which means that as Palestinians living in the West Bank, we're allowed to go to our cities, but these cities are divided and uh, are like small boxes, different areas by closed roads and by uh, Yeah, I appreciate the description and I've been hearing about all the new checkpoints popping up too, so it's um, horrifying to hear about all of the different ways that people are are being cut off. And really, I mean, that's the, the goal of the colonizer is to separate and keep people from being able to be in community with each other. And Al Hara has such a beautiful community. Um, I've had the privilege of getting to, of course, be with you in person and see Al Hara's work. Um, and I was wondering if you could tell our audience about how you created Al Hara. Um, and, and what that process was like. And then we can talk some more about the work that Al Hara um, creates. Sure. Well, first, I have to explain what is the meaning of Al Hara. Al Hara means the neighborhood. And we, when we wanted to choose a name in 2005, uh, we wanted something that is close to the community, that is uh, uh, that gives us some kind of uh, inspiration from the community. And because from Al Hara we have stories, we have conflicts, we have relationships, that's why we chose Al Hara. And we tried the word Al Hara on our international friends, and it was a disaster because they were saying Al Hara instead of Al Hara. And Al Hara means shit. So, uh, 
So we were really thinking whether we should change it or not. And then we started saying, no, we will teach our friends how to say it with ha and not with ka. Uh, from the beginning, we believe as a group of people who started the Hara that uh, theater is a powerful tool to create positive change in the community. It's a powerful tool to create awareness, to create uh, productions that are close to our community and that's why we chose this name. We were established in 2005. We are located in Bejala, but we are a touring company. So we go to all the cities, refugee camps, uh, towns, the villages, all over the West Bank when we can because recently we could not. And uh, when we are very lucky, we can get to Jerusalem with a permit if we have a group of actors who have a permit to go to perform in Jerusalem. So when there's a chance to go to perform in Jerusalem, we celebrate and we immediately contact our colleagues at the National Theatre in Jerusalem to perform there, uh, to reach our audiences in uh, Jerusalem. So this is how uh, Al-Hara started and it was a group of people who are an actor, a director and uh, I wasn't involved in theater uh, except uh, a long time ago in that theater and then uh, for me to come to the theater world I've been learning all my skills through experience and through making mistakes and learning from my mistakes and so on. So this is how we started al uh, if you want me to tell you a little bit more about what we do, Please. then um, we uh, produce theater for children, youth, and uh, adults. And uh, we try to tour with our productions in different cities and towns and villages. Uh, sometimes we try to tour regionally, so in Jordan, Egypt, Tunisia, wherever is possible to reach. And we also have international touring. So, for example, uh, next year, we're trying to organize a tour of the play called Meramide to Denmark and Sweden. And it's a play that talks about uh, the Nakba in 1948. And also, we included a part about also our second, third, and fourth displacement of people like now in Gaza. Uh, we also have different programs. So we have a program on women, on children and young people, a program for uh, people with disability, where we produce theater for them. We try to include them in our shows and we also try to create productions that can create awareness in the, com in the community and also create more knowledge about how powerful theater can impact people's uh, mental uh, ideas, ideologies, and so on. And the last program that we have is capacity building of artists and technicians. Because in Palestine, we don't have a university that teaches theater or directing or playwriting or even technical needs like costume, light, sound, uh, scenography, and all of this. So we have been... Uh, training people in Palestine uh, to work in the performing arts field as uh, these six uh, fields. And then we started training also young emerging directors. Uh, and these young emerging directors, we bring international directors to give workshops. And then we try and give them a small grant to produce their own play. And then they perform it either in our uh, Bethlehem site-specific festival that I will show you pictures of, and also at on uh, Palestine International uh, Children and Youth Theatre Festival, uh, and our Yalla Yalla Street Carnival that I will show you also picture of soon. Amazing, Al Hara does so much, and just to hear you describe it, I'm like, well, you know, it's it's amazing the way that Al Hara is responding to the community and working with what the community needs as far as storytelling, but also what the community needs as far as training goes. Um, so 
I the first productions I saw by El Jara were children's plays um, that you were touring in different places. Um, and so I see, I mean, I think the children's theater really responds to what children in the community are needing. Um, but in that particular children's uh, theater, uh, when I saw those shows uh, in the festival, they um, you had also trained the people who were working on them, right? The directors and the writers to write specifically for children's theater. Um, so I would love if you could talk more about those, but I also think you were hosting an international children's theater festival this past yes. October or November that was canceled um, yes. because of the genocide. Um, so yeah, let's have you talk more about your children's theater and the training sure. that you've also done there. Well, for us, children are uh, really the most uh, important beneficiaries that we work with. And the reason is that children in Palestine need to feel as children, even for a short period of time during a performance, during a training and, and so on, because they live in a very, very unhealthy environment where they do not feel uh, they are children. They don't live their childhood. So through our productions, we try to use music, colors, and dance just to let them enjoy being children even for one hour at a time. And uh, that's why we feel it's important to develop children's theater, to, to develop playwriting for children and directing for children. And uh, last year, as you said, uh, Marina, we had prepared everything for the Palestine International, uh, Palestine International Theater Festival for Children. It was supposed to happen on the 13th of October. And we were going to host eight international companies from all over the world, uh, from Argentina, Mexico, Brazil, uh, Scotland, uh, Sweden, all kinds of them. And then we woke up on the 7th of October and we try to contact our partners to tell them at least to cancel their tickets so they won't lose their tickets because they were coming. Everything was prepared and we had to cancel everything and postpone it to this year. And even this year, we will not be able to have it. So we'll postpone it to next year. So uh, producing theater for children is the, one of the most components of uh, how the theater work. And to be honest, it's also the most needed because children in Palestine don't have a lot. So to have a festival for them, it's the only children festival that takes place. And uh, recently uh, also at the Palestinian National Theater, they started having a puppet theater for children, which is good. So uh, there's a lot of interest. You know, families come with their parents, families come with their children. Usually, we used to see mothers coming with their children. Now, it's the father and the mother coming with their children, which is great to see. So, it's one of the most important and most uh, uh, impactful work that we do for children because of the situation of children in Palestine. I really appreciate that. And I noticed that when I was seeing, I was sitting in the audience and I was like, whole families are here. This isn't just a mom and a kid. This is the entire family has come to see these plays. Um, they have quite the reputation for, for being not only good, like good productions, but I think thought provoking uh, and productions that get kids excited for them. Yeah. Just we even... try to have a high quality artistic work, even for children, because sometimes they think that children theater is really easy. It's not. It's the most difficult to do is children theater. It's more difficult than uh, uh, theater for adults, to be honest, because it's a responsibility. And children are like a sponge, so they take whatever they see. And we try to really be very, very careful. And we study, and we even have uh, children come and see the play before we uh, open it, just to understand whether they really follow whether there are things that maybe we shouldn't have. We even invite teachers sometimes to see so we can really take the responsibility for anything we put for children. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, even beyond Children's Theater, you, Alhara, creates plays that respond to local issues, 
Uh, so one of my favorite plays that I have not seen through Al-Hara, but that was published in an anthology um, by uh, that Samar Asabar uh, published uh, with Gary, um, but Shakespeare's Sisters, this really beautiful play that I, I mean, it moves me to tears every time I read it. And I believe that was also responding to local issues. Um, yeah. Can you speak at all about that play? Yeah, sure. Actually, Shakespeare's play, uh, Shakespeare's Sisters, is uh, is very personal to me because the idea came from my own experience. Uh, being a single woman over <laughs> over 50 now, but over 35 when we did the play, uh, and uh, how the Palestinian society treats women who are divorced, who are uh, uh, single, who are uh, widowed in Palestine. And we have a very, very, uh, sometimes we, we, in some areas, we have a very patriarchal society. And, uh, usually women are the most uh, to suffer. And um, usually women are also judged uh, a lot and they do not have a lot of kind of freedom. So we did the research. Uh, a, a researcher at Bethlehem University who passed away a few years ago, she went and interviewed uh, women in different areas in the West Bank. And, uh, based on her research, we took the stories, the real stories of women, and uh, we had uh, a director from Italy who was coming to direct the show. His name is Pietro Floridia. And uh, everything was set and ready to uh, to start the rehearsals. He arrived at Tel Aviv airport. Then he disappeared. I sent a car to pick him up. He never showed up. And we started calling Italy. Nobody knew where he was. So I was really worried. For almost 24 hours, I didn't hear anything about him. So he calls from Italy. And he says, Marina, I've been uh, sort of... Uh, stopped at the airport in Tel Aviv and uh, then they stamped my passport not allowed to enter for five years and they sent me back to Italy. He said, but if you provide me with Skype, at that time we didn't have Zoom. <laughs> so if you provide Skype, I'm willing to direct the show. And I said, are you crazy? How can you direct the show from Italy to Palestine with your uh, bad English, uh, with Palestinian uh, and he said, just talk to the team and see. So we felt as a team uh, that it was an artistic challenge and it was also a political challenge. So we decided to do it. We worked with the group for almost uh, five weeks uh, online with Arabic, English, Italian, mixed kind of languages until uh, uh, it reached a stage where we said we have to uh, have him with the team. So I organized for the team to go to Jordan and we had a one week rehearsal in Jordan. He came, we opened the play, play in Jordan and then uh, we took it back to Palestine and toured. It also went to the French festival in Edinburgh. It's one of the most beautiful and most dear plays to my heart and it really impacted a lot of women, it impacted a lot of people in the community. And I was very happy that you also uh, did it at uh, your university, Marina. So it's great. So we do a lot of work on women's rights. We do work on uh, inclusion of people with disability in the performing arts. And now we have an actress, the first female actress who has visual disability, who is in five of our productions. And now she has a stand-up comedy show that she talks about the challenges she faces in her life. Her name is Sharihan Hadwe. She's also amazing. And hopefully she will take the show to, well, she's invited to Shubak Festival in London next year. Mm -hmm. and so we try to see what is needed in the society, but we do it with a very high artistic quality with good directors and to really impact people uh, locally and internationally. Well, and I think, I mean, just from seeing how people responded to Shakespeare sisters in the States, I mean, a lot of women said like, this really resonates with me uh, and we're so grateful for the creation of this play. Um, yeah. 
and for people who are listening, I think on your the El Hara Facebook, at least the last time I looked, um, you also have a disability like mini series that you had created. Um, yeah. So, I mean, you're really doing work that's accessible in different media also for people to to see. And I think Sherry is on in the, the show. It is. Uh, during COVID, we had to find another way to contact with our audiences. And that's why we started producing series, web series, and also short films. And we also even uh, transformed the one of our plays for to live uh, into three short films. Uh, also, uh, this year, because of the situation, we cannot perform easily. So what we were doing in the last um, eight months is we have been concentrating on doing psychosocial uh, drama, sessions for children in different schools in the Bethlehem area uh, because schools were really requesting this. We have been doing the also psychosocial drama sessions for people with disability on a weekly basis. Every Saturday we have a group with different abilities. We also have been doing this with women groups in the Elisha camp and uh, our uh, theater for women from different uh, villages around Bethlehem. And uh, what we also started doing also since last November uh, is to take stories of children and women who were killed in Gaza, who are martyrs, and tell their life story. Not that they are only numbers, but to tell their names, their life stories. And it started really with one of the children who was killed, his name is Yusuf, and his mother was looking for him in hospitals. And she kept saying, have you seen Yusuf? He has curly hair, he has blue eyes, he has white skin. And she kept calling for him. And then she told his story. So uh, my colleague, Nicola, uh, who is an actor, has been uh, recording this as stories, like a podcast. And we have been uh, putting subtitles in English and sharing them on social media with groups, uh, with uh, even activists in different countries who wanted to use materials from Gaza. We have been recording almost, I think, 20 or 25 stories. Um, and we have been also advocating and educating people online uh, to uh, sort of update them about what is happening here and in Gaza and in the West Bank. Uh, so this this is what we have been doing in the last eight months. Uh, we've been trying also to find ways to survive because also what happened in 2019 is that we lost uh, most of our funders, especially the EU, because uh, in 2019, uh, the EU uh, got a lot of pressure from the Zionist movement in different European countries uh, to, uh, sorry, uh, to uh, have, am I, share, I am, uh, am I sharing? No. You're sharing, we see um, the, the Facebook, I think that you want to yeah. to see the power. So. Yeah, yeah, I mean, okay. Uh, so, Sorry for the technical problems. So uh, from 2019, the EU have added a new condition, political condition on their funding to the Palestinian organizations, where they consider uh, seven Palestinian political factions as terrorists. So if we accept this as civil society organizations, it means we incriminate our people. So we stopped accepting funds from the EU, from the Swedish International Development Agency, from the Germans, and so on. And uh, we have been negotiating with them to change their condition, but they didn't. So we lost. This were, these were the main funders for arts and culture in Palestine. And since the beginning of war uh, on Gaza, uh, we also uh, felt that we cannot accept uh, we cannot accept funding from uh, the governments who have been supporting Israeli weapons. Uh, and it means that we are losing a lot of our uh, resources that 
covers our costs and um, so on to make us continue because we completely depend on international funding. We don't have local funding and culture is the last on the priority of the Palestinian Authority, so we don't have really any support. So that's why uh, these were some of the challenges, including all the oppression of the Israeli occupation. Uh, Marina, if you allow me, I would like to share some of the pictures of our work so people can see some of the work. Mm -hmm. So these are pictures from uh, the Yalla Yalla uh, street carnival that we do. We made these giant puppets uh, together with a company from France called Giant Puppets. And we usually have it every year. Last year, we couldn't have it because of the situation. So these are some of the pictures from the festival in Ramallah. We had it in Ramallah, in Bethlehem, in Beit Jala, and in Girzeit, and also in Bethlehem, as you see near the uh, Rachel's tomb and uh, near the wall. Uh, and uh, these are some of the pictures of the street festival. And these are some of our plays. This is a play called uh, Khararif, which means gossip. And it was based on uh, Eugene. Uh, well, he's a, a Roman writer who wrote this play in 1960, which, mean, which is, uh, talks about a couple who were stuck in a room and they were surrounded by uh, confrontations and uh, how their uh, relationship uh, changes. This is Meramia, which will go to Denmark and Sweden next year. And we're hoping to take it, if possible, to the United States and to Latin America uh, in the future. These are some of our uh, video work and our uh, spots uh, for different films. This is Sherry Han. And this is a play called Darkness and Light. It talks about uh, the right of women with disability uh, to be married, to have children, to raise children, to work in art if they wanted. So, and this is Sharihan, the stand-up comedy show. And this is a children play called Italia for little kids, uh, three to six years old. This is our Bethlehem site specific festival. As you see, we have it in old houses, old squares, in different cities in the old city of Bethlehem, Bejala, and also Hebron. And this is inside the house. So people walk with the artists inside the house. And this is another uh, performance. And uh, these are some of the things that we usually uh, uh, do uh, with our work, and I wanted to share these visuals with you to to see uh, a little pictures. bit visually. Yeah, the pictures are gorgeous, Marina. Thank you so much for showing them to us. Um, I want to remind those people who are tuning in now that this is no summary, Golden Threads online conversations with artists who don't fit in a box. And we are here with Marina Baham uh, from Ashtar Theater in Beit Jala. Um, and yeah. Al Hara Theater. Al Hara Theater. Oh, I'm so sorry. Yes, I, <laughs> I thought you were. Yes, I. Um, and we've been. We just saw some beautiful pictures that Al Hara had um, uh, created of different projects. And Marina, on that note, so I want to invite people in the Zoom rooms to please, if you have questions, put them in the chat. We're happy to see them. We had a great comment from someone who Marina was uh, thanking you for the great work that you and Al Hara do. Um, and that they were going to look at the recorded link later. But if others have questions, please put them in. Um, but Marina, you were just talking about the Bethlehem site-specific uh, theater festival, and yes. I got to see it last year. And I would love to just talk in a little bit more detail about some of the pieces because I was so struck. Um, I know that this past year, uh, the performances were in Beit Jala, Bethlehem, and Hebron. Uh, yes. And there were interviews done in each of those places. And then from the interviews, the short plays were created that were then put in back in each community. So a story was coming out and then sort of being told again to that community, which I thought was a really beautiful concept. Um, can you talk more about 
uh, how the site-specific theater festival happens and also some of the stories and interviews? Yeah, uh, well, the whole the idea of the site-specific started in 2020 after COVID started in Palestine and the world. And uh, at that period, uh, in 2020, Bethlehem was the Arab capital of culture. But of course, because of COVID, we couldn't celebrate uh, Bethlehem. So what we did is at the beginning of 2020, just before they had the lockdown in Bejala. Bejala was the first city to have lockdown in the Middle East because we had a group staying at a hotel in Bejala, at Angel Hotel. And they left when they arrived in Greece. They told, they checked them and they had COVID. So Bejala was the first to be uh, under lockdown on the 5th of March. Just a week before, we had a workshop with Red Iron from Scotland on uh, how to direct shows in uh, different sites. And uh, uh, as a result, we were planning that uh, five directors would direct their own shows. But of course, because of COVID, we couldn't do it. So we postponed it till 2021. And the uh, Bethlehem Site Specific Festival was the first event and festival to happen in Bethlehem in outside courtyard and uh, old houses, and open spaces as a way to uh, really be able to have festivals because we couldn't have them inside theaters. The idea was to collect stories from older people, old houses stories, and to uh, give these stories to the different directors to write concepts about how they see directing this play. And we also chose old spaces and they chose which one's suitable for their own shows and they produced their shows. And then we had people coming to old houses, to old squares, both in, uh, we had it the first time in Bethlehem and Bejala. Then last year we had it in Bethlehem, Bejala, and the old city in Hebron. The old city in Hebron is so um, so hard to live in because there is an Israeli settlement in the middle of the old city. So to revive the old spaces in the old city and to give the community a, a place where they can celebrate these old houses and old people was amazing. And seeing the old people who saw their stories, one in front of them, was so emotional, was so a field of uh, gratitude that we really recognized their stories, their life stories, and celebrated them with different uh, generations. It was beautiful, magnificent. We really, really were very happy, and they were very happy uh, with these performances. Uh, and we hope to continue this next year, hopefully. Inshallah. It's so meaningful that you're able to really, I mean, theater and storytelling is about so much about community and about making these stories known to different people. And especially because al Hara uh, does tour different um, stories too. So it's nice to to be able to uh, hear and, and know that. Um, yes. Yeah. That's true. You, you were talking about what you're working on right now with um, some of the different um, projects and you would use the term uh, that I don't think we use as much in the United States um, with, uh, was it psychosocial theater projects? Uh, can you talk more about what those projects look like? Because they seem um, like maybe what yeah. we would call drama therapy projects. And so I'm curious yes. to know more. Uh, they're not projects, but they are sessions that were created to help children uh, and women, people with disability, uh, feel uh, to have a safe space where they can express their feelings, their fears, their emotions, and their trauma that they have been living through in this period. Uh, through drama exercises, through sometimes psychological exercises. So it's not really drama therapy because we're not drama therapists, but it was a combination of things all together that helped children, women, people with disability to feel safe enough to talk 
really about their dreams, their nightmares, their fears, their issues that they face, because sometimes they're judged at school, they're judged by their parents. And sometimes we don't talk about our weaknesses and about fears in front of everybody. So this is a safe space where they can do this. And that's why we have been concentrating a lot on this. We have done almost 100 sessions of uh, psychosocial drama, which is a mixture of, of all what I've been saying. And we had some uh, of our trainers work together to develop this session that has been very helpful for the, all, all the groups that we've been working with. And to talk about what we're preparing now, uh, we are preparing for uh, uh, two art summer camps uh, for children because now uh, schools are uh, holiday. Uh, and uh, it was a difficult, difficult school year because sometimes they were on time, sometimes they were on strike, sometimes they're not going to school. So we thought that it would be good to have a special artistic summer camp for children age 6 to 10 years, where they would have dance, recycling, creating uh, music instruments from recycled materials, uh, theater, uh, puppet making, and uh, circus things uh, for a period of two weeks, where they come every day uh, from 10 to 2, and uh, enjoy uh, their time because there isn't a lot for them to do things during the summer. So it's not only us actually, a lot of theaters, a lot of organizations are organized some summer camp. But we're trying to make it more artistic than anything else. Sounds like someone would be very excited to go to this yes. summer camp in the summer. Um, wow, and so besides, so you're doing the psychosocial uh, sessions, um, the summer camp is coming up. Um, you mentioned the work that Nicola is also doing with El Hara um, generally about putting women and children's voices from Gaza um, online and accessible so that people are really hearing them and not just digesting some news stories here and there about what's happening. Um, you also mentioned that the festival might be rescheduled, not for this next year, but for the upcoming year. Um, yes, not so for this year, but for next year. Yes. The next one, yeah. yeah. It sounds like yeah. there are so many things on Al Hara's plate. Um, how are you? And I know you actually are, are going, leaving to do speaking because you do advocacy work yes. too. Um, yes. Can you talk a little bit about that work that you'll be doing? Sure. Um, actually, what happened is that in uh, March I discovered that I have a valid visa to the UK uh, until the end of July. So I thought, okay. I asked some of my friends in the UK, especially theatres, and I said, if I come to the, to, to the UK and speak at theatres and uh, different venues, do you think this would be useful? And they said, yes, very much. So for the last uh, two months, I've been contacting different theatres, uh, different artists, different, different friends in different cities, and I managed to organise 16 different events in, in 15 different cities all over the UK, from London to Plymouth to Chester to York to Manchester, Derby, Edinburgh, Glasgow, everywhere. So what is happening is um, my sister lives in London, so we're renting a car. She's going to drive me from one city to the other. We didn't have any funding for this tour, uh, for anything. So we, a friend of mine created the GoFundMe uh, campaign to try and uh, ask people to donate money towards the cost of the tour in the UK. I've been asked by so many uh, in different cities, not only to have the events, but to have meetings with artists. The idea is to uh, first educate people about what is happening, open opportunities for new collaborations with new theatres in the UK, uh, try to exchange with artists and network with British and uh, Scottish artists and Welsh artists, and also to create um, something called Shining Stars, Friend of the Hara Theatre, Bethlehem, in the UK, uh, so they can be more involved, uh, more engaged in our work, 
and try to support uh, our work in the future. Uh, so I'm hoping that we will have uh, more uh, Friends of Lahara now in the UK after this tour. And this is part of the advocacy work that we do and also to tell our friends and uh, especially artists in the UK about what is happening. So I will uh, try to share the GoFundMe uh, campaign with you on chat. And, uh, you know, please come and see. I will also try to share, uh, I'll see if I can share the schedule here. And uh, if people are in the UK or if they have friends there, please ask them to uh, to come to the different uh, sort of different uh, locations because I will be in different places in the UK. So I hope I will see some of them in these places. Definitely. Uh, so the GoFundMe is now in the chat for anyone who is um, able to see it in the current room where we are. If you're on the live stream, um, the GoFundMe is titled Al Hara Theater, a voice for theater and culture in Palestine. Uh, and so if you're on GoFundMe, you should be able to search that title and it should come up for you. So if you're watching it um, outside of the Zoom room, hopefully you'll be able to, to see that. Um, and Marina, thank you because this advocacy work is so important and it's so important to hear Palestinians who are working in the arts who are doing this and can and let us know what the situation on the ground is in uh, in the West Bank. Um, what is your advice for artists who are trying to make art now? Um, and, and what is your advice for people who are looking to support Palestine? Do you have um, thoughts that you might wanna share with people who are, are trying to figure out what they can best do? Sure, I think um, really it's very, very important uh, to keep talking about Palestine, and not only about Palestine, about justice, because we're not talking about uh, only Palestine. There are lots of people in the world that are under occupation and have a lot of uh, wars happening. But the most important thing that came out of this uh, genocide against Gaza is that uh, students, uh, organizations, people in the world uh, realize that they are living in a fake democracy, also a fake uh, belief in freedom of expression. And to be honest, seeing what is happening uh, at universities and uh, in different cities on weekly basis and daily basis tells us that nobody is safe. Nobody can be living and expressing themselves freely. So please do not be afraid. Don't be afraid to get sacked out of your work. Don't be afraid to tell the truth and don't be afraid to talk about whatever you want to talk about because this is part of human rights to have the right to express yourself freely without fearing anybody, without fearing any control by any government or anybody because we have the right to talk, we have the right to say what we are thinking. So I really appreciate what is happening all over the world, globally. Uh, take action by uh, telling your friends, by continuing uh, activism, uh, by uh, also inviting artists or inviting work from Palestine to your country because Arts is the language of the world and it could really impact people by seeing a production about Palestine, about our uh, work. Uh, for us, one of the things I've been really asking people, because theaters, and not only theaters, but theaters and performing arts organizations, we're losing our support. So I ask and invite big theaters, big performing arts companies to adopt a theater, adopt a circus, adopt a, a music school in Palestine to continue our work with children, with young people, with women. They all need us to continue working and stop, stop the government from giving weapons to continue the genocide against people in Gaza. People in Gaza have reached a state where they cannot take it. You know, I have friends who keep telling me every single day they try to find a place to sleep. 
they try to find water, they try to find food, they try to feel the minimum of safety somewhere. And uh, all, all of this, if the governments of the world decide to stop it, they can stop it. But there is a kind of hypocrisy and double standards towards different different country and I say stop the war on Ukraine and stop the war on Palestine stop the war in Sudan stop the war everywhere against people because it's part of respecting human rights and justice and it should never be controversial to say to stop a yeah. war it's it's, yes. I, it's insane uh, that it has become controversial to do that but you're right that if governments wanted to do it they could and it's on us to put the pressure on them especially if we're living in a place like the United States or the UK to really pressure our governments to do um, what they need to do and what they should have done months ago um it's I love your idea of uh, larger theaters in the uh who can support uh theaters who might need this funding support especially because you outlined so clearly that there, after 2019, the funding that you were able to receive took a big hit um, because you're not willing to um, submit to these ludicrous demands from different funding agencies. Um, and so if people can support the work of, of uh, Al Hara, that's amazing. Uh, and so I'm hoping people that are listening are able to do that or able to encourage a local theater that you know to do that work as well. Um, yes. You, and Al Hara teach us some steadfastness through all of this. And so um, we thank you for being this light here uh, for us as well. Uh, I noticed you posted the schedule in the yes. chat. I posted it on the chat as a PDF because I couldn't post it as a link yet. Okay, it doesn't, I don't think it's opening for me. I think PDFs can be tricky on Zoom, but um, if there's a way, is it possible for you to share your screen for the PDF and that way we can just maybe announce yes. the dates out loud? I can, I can, yeah, I can share it. Uh, yeah. uh, let me try to share, share one second. Uh, <laughs> let me see. This is a bit tricky, but we'll see. Yes, can you see it? Yes, we can. Okay, so I, I will go down. Uh, I will be in London, Plymouth. I can send it by email to someone and uh, to Cardiff. And people who are watching the live stream can also see this. So this is great. I mean, people can pause the link and, and go back if they need to look at a particular date. But you really are going everywhere. Yes, uh, people, I, I, I'm still getting requests. And I said, I don't have any more dates. Yeah. you know before my visa finishes so and in addition to these events i've been asked by theaters by artists to meet them separately i've been also asked by the star union the arts council to speak to them so mm -hmm. so this is Thank some places are question. small venues some places are uh, big venues so I will try to do something. Let me try and see if I can get it as a, a picture. Or I, I will put my email and I can send it to anybody uh, by email uh, if they are interested. That's a great idea. Thank you. So this is my email. Excellent. Thank you, Marina. Um, well, we have come to the end of our conversation for today. Thank you so much, Marina, for this amazing um, description of everything that Alhara does. Seeing the work that you specifically do as a person is very inspiring, and I'm so grateful um, for you and for everyone who got to hear you speak today, um, to hear about what you are doing and what this beautiful company in Bitjala is also doing. Um, Thank you very much, Marina, and thank you all for uh, being there. I'm not sure who's there, but <laughs> um, um, I hope that uh, there are lots of people who are hearing us and uh, giving us time. I think uh, this shows that you uh, you are uh, people who are humane, which is very, very important. So thank you very much, and uh, please pray for uh, 
stopping the genocide against uh, Gaza and also uh, for justice for everyone. Thank you so much. And thank you, Marina. And thank you, Golden uh, Red Company. Thank you, Sahar and Windy and everyone. Yes. Um, I would like to thank HowlRound for hosting this program. And as a reminder, all No Summary episodes live on Golden Thread's YouTube channel and HowlRound's website. Thank you to Wendy Reyes, our live stream technician, and to the rest of Golden Thread's team, Sahar, Michelle, Sheila, Linda, and Sununa. And a big thank you, of course, to our audiences. Next week, No Summary will host a conversation with Ahmed from El Hakawati, uh, moderated by Kate Morahini, uh, on June 13th at 11 a.m. For more information, you can visit Golden Thread's website at goldenthread.org or join the email list to stay on top of all of the programs and events that Golden Thread has to offer. Thank you and goodbye for now. Thank you.